All right, so again, my name is Stuart Schlossman. Thank you very much for joining us. I am president and founder of MS Views and News. I am saying, hey, hey, everybody out there. All right, and uh, again, this is a, this program tonight is a virtual event, like you know. It is a Compass to MS Care program where we were doing these in many rural areas and suburban areas around the United States last year. I think we did 40 of these types of programs in, in these areas. So for tonight's event, though, we have Dr. Janicki, and Dr. Janicki is going to speak for about 35 minutes, and then he's going to do about 30 minutes of Q&A. We have fielded a lot of questions already that people, when they registered, they were able to post in their questions, and we did print those out, and I do have them, as well as anybody has something new to add to it. Well, that would be great, too. On the right side of your screen, you can see where you can click on to leave a question. All right. After Dr. Janicki, Jeff Siegel is here. And Jeff is an MS exercise specialist, okay? And Jeff will be speaking with you all after Dr. Janicki's talk and after his Q&A. Jeff will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have another 30 minutes of questions and answers. All right, before we begin, though, I want to let you know that tonight's program, as you can see, we're doing this program with support from Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, Novartis, and Santa Fe. And I can't hear everybody for them to say thank you but I'll say thank you for you all, all right? Thank you very much to our supporters. And now we're gonna get started with Dr. Janicki. But before I do, just a little intro. Dr. Janicki is associated with Witham Health Services in Indianapolis. And uh, again, he's been treating MS patients for a multitude of years. <laughs> and, we're, and we're gonna let Dr. Janicki now speak with you and I'm gonna get out of here and let him bring good, empowering wisdom to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, glad to be with you guys, if, if anything, but virtually, unfortunately. So uh, as you can see, the title of this talk is a play on words by a, a novel by Lewis Carroll, a book by Lewis Carroll called Alice Through the Looking Glass. This is my version of MS Through the Looking Glass or MS in the year 2020. Uh, very interesting book. It was actually the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and it's probably a little bit more popular, and where everything was kind of backwards. If you, the quicker you ran towards the goal, the further you got away from it, kind of, kind of like uh, what we're dealing with, with right now. So, I'm going to impart some, some information about multiple sclerosis, kind of general stuff. Probably a lot of you know about this. Some of my thoughts and feelings about where we are in the, in the year 2020. And uh, let's kind of move along. So it is an interesting disease. And, and what we know about it is that uh, no two people are exactly alike. It is uh, important to realize that, that this is a very heterogeneous disorder and that we treat people, each person individually. And we can look at studies and those are generalizations of what how we should treat people, but no two people are alike with this disease. And uh, I have a couple of members in one family who have the disease who have been, are entirely different treatments, uh, disease modifying therapies. So everybody likes MS facts. And yeah, go ahead and load them, Bill. So what we know about facts about this disease is now we're saying there's over 1 million people in North America alone have the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And approximately 85% of individuals begin with relapsing remitting MS, okay? Relapsing remitting MS affects women almost three to one versus men. Approximately 10% of individuals have a progressive course from onset. And the, in the progressive form of the disease, it's almost equally affected men and women. The first treatment became available in 1993. We have approximately, not counting again uh, generics and some duplicates, we have approximately 15 disease modifying therapies available and nine classes and with their mechanism of action, nine different mechanisms of action and how they work. Virtually 100% of MS patients are positive for Epstein Barr virus, but the, the flip side of that, so is 90 to 90. 5% of the general population. And just a next one, Bill. Just a quick kind of timeline about the development of these of, of these medications that came out. You can see 
starting on the far left, uh, the first agent, uh, uh, interferon beta 1b came out in 1993. And as you can see, we've progressed through the years with numerous medications becoming available for patients to treat multiple sclerosis. And these are our standard disease modifying therapies. Uh, again, we're missing some of the generics and one medication did that did get uh, removed from the, from the market. So we can, if we want to, we can uh, organize these agents uh, by, and in this slide, I organize them by routes and how they were given. So the injections are listed, interferons, glatiramiracetate, the orals are listed, in which include fingolimod, teraflunamide, dimethylfumarate, siponamod, cladribine, ozinamod, and the infusions, natalizumab, elemtuzumab, and, and ocrelizumab have been. But we could equally kind of break these down, and maybe more importantly, uh, into mechanisms of action. Uh, and maybe even more important than that, in, in efficacy of these agents. So I'm going to present to you tonight some unquestionable facts. And the first unquestionable fact, number one, is this. Our ability to predict the disease course at onset is limited. Again, going back to no two people are alike, this disease can vary very wild, wildly in, in any individual patient, where they can be stable for years only to take off and have multiple attacks or progressive disability. So our ability to know what course an individual patient is going to take is extremely limited. Therefore, choosing the right medication sometimes becomes very, very difficult. I'm gonna show you the next slide, which is a uh, der derivation of, uh, from, uh, is a slide, produced by Stephen Krager uh, in, at Mount Sinai in New York. And he, he depicts multiple sclerosis as, as kind of like a, a leaky swimming pool. And what we mean by that is you have a shallow end and you have a deep end and the deep end uh, consists of mainly the, uh, the, the cerebral hemispheres, the shallow end is more the spinal cord and, uh, and optic nerves. So lesions can develop, and, and in, if you look at the A, R, I, S, radiographically isolated syndrome, this patient does not know they have multiple sclerosis. Uh, their lesions are below the surface of, of being uh, identified. So that's what this leaking swimming pool depicts. You have a certain level of uh, nervous tissue that is there. You may have lesions, and only by happenstance, Maybe you have severe headaches and your doctor orders an MRI scan, we discover these lesions. In the clinically isolated syndrome in, in, in part B there, a lesion comes to a fruition or a lesion comes a, a available out to the surface. And in this case, it would be in the spinal cord, the more shallow end of, the, of this swimming pool. And at this time, you still have those other two lesions in your cerebral hemisphere, but you've developed this, this lesion that brought you to uh, the doctor and, and objectivity. Uh, uh, the object objectivity brings you to brings the disease into into focus. Going on into C, we have relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, where you accumulate more lesions, and again a relapse is depicted by the spike, the lesion that spiked there. And what's important to realize if you look at A, B, and C is this level of nervous tissue is declining. So the, the leaky swimming pool becomes uh, relevant. So what happens is not only are you having more lesions come to the surface, uh, but you're also losing brain tissue. So we were really excited back in 1993 to the early 2000s because we had agents for the first time to treat this disease. We opened the door, we saw that we had some light at the end of the tunnel, we're gonna be able to have, impart some, uh, some treatments on patients who have never had treatments before, short of giving them steroids when they would have a relapse. But, but what's happened, can you go back just a second, Bill, I'm sorry. What's happened is that, yeah, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and we may have taken one step up the ladder, maybe a step and a half, but we're still far away from 
reaching that goal of, of, of really truly treating this disease. Uh, that which leads us to unquestionable fact number two. Conventional clinical imaging can miss or underestimate on ongoing damage. So part of knowing if a patient has multiple sclerosis is their MRI scan, okay? Uh, their MRI scan will depict lesions, uh, but it's far from being exact and far from being perfect in telling what is truly going on with this disease. As we've gone through the years and the decades with this disease, we find that it's not only a white matter disease, it's also a gray matter disease. And we're depicting more uh, lesions in gray matter, which lead to more atrophy, which lead to categorization of this disease even further. This is a picture of, of an MRI scan, same patient, one year apart, left, Came to, the, came to the diagnosis because of optic neuritis and some, I believe, some double vision. Uh, I don't have a picture of the brain stem it did, or the optic nerves. It did not show us anything. Uh, six months, I think a year later, uh, this is what the MRI now looked like. Development of more lesions and just that short a period of time. So that again, that unquestionable, we MRI scans are not always telling us the true facts of what's going on with this disease, which leads us back to relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Again, that notion that, that as you've seen probably in old slides, we talked about the iceberg. What we can measure on the surface, we can see in that spike, but there's a lot of things going on underneath. And, and not only that, not only are there a lot of things going on underneath that we can't measure lesion-wise, but we're losing brain tissue as time goes on. Unquestionable fact number three, MS is rarely benign over the long term when dysfunction is care carefully interrogated. And what we mean by that is that if you truly look at a patient and follow them over the course of years, you will see, see slow deterioration in their functioning, worsening of their disease. It doesn't escape pretty much anybody. I'm not a believer that there is benign MS. I used to believe that there was, but I think that that's kind of a fallacy and we have to be very careful about, about benign MS. I think it does exist, but we used to say it exists in maybe about 10% of patients with MS. I would say it's more like one to 2% of patients with multiple sclerosis. A depiction of white matter tracts. There are literally billions of white matter tracts, and this is the primary uh, damage to the brain that occurs, is in the white matter tracts. But again, as I mentioned, what we're finding is not only a white matter being involved, we're seeing gray matter involvement too. And this is kind of focusing our treatments for the future to different things. We talked a lot about relapsing or emitting multiple sclerosis, uh, section C. Let's talk a little bit about section D, which is secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, and section E, which is secondary progressive multiple sclerosis with activity. And the whole notion here is you accumulate more lesions, but you can see the leaking swimming pool comes into play. The, the, the level of, of water in the pool is dropped dramatically. So lesions that were not symptomatic can now become symptomatic. Things that have happened in the brain uh, maybe previously are now becoming more relevant as far as disability progression, more difficulty walking, uh, more difficulty with bowel or bladder function. Section E, uh, secondary progressive MS with activity is just kind of a, an, an offshoot that even though you're in the secondary progressive phase, you can still have active disease. It doesn't mean that this disease is is turned off and become less inflammatory. So let's talk a little bit about treatment approaches. Go ahead and load the whole slide there from, thank you, Bill. So there are pretty much, there's two groups of treatment uh, thought, and, and we, we talk about escalators, and that's when you see a patient, you start them on a platform agent, you move them to another agent, and long-term follow-up studies, of patients on platform agents reveal the risk of under treatment. 
We have other kind of physicians who believe in early high efficacy where early intervention with maybe stronger or more efficacious medications might substantially alter the disease course and prevent irreversible progression, whereas later treatment might not confer much benefit. So there are people who believe in, in starting in a stepwise fashion, maybe starting them with an injectable and, and maybe in this day and age, and one of the oral agents, depending upon the oral agent, and then uh, stepwise increasing that medication and the more relapses they have. And there are other people who believe that uh, nothing is off the table from the get-go. So somewhere in between is probably the right answer. And again, because everybody's individual and, and how they present with this disease, uh, you, you might not start somebody on a really high potency medications unless they had disease in their brainstem or cerebellum. You might go with step with platform uh, treatment and, and increase their dosage stepwise, but you do run the risk that you are under treating these patients. One of the things that happens is that over time, you do end up probably in, in over half the patients switch their treatment. When you switch is because of lack of efficacy from the previous medication. How you switch depends upon what you had them on before. You have to be very cautious about switching from one agent to another. And sometimes the timing becomes very important about, about switching. That if you take them off of one medication, you can't start uh, second medication uh, right, uh, right away because of uh, potential damage to the immune system. There's some recent data, some interesting data, we talked about the benign disease that, that people who have been treated for a long period of time might actually be able to stop treatment, so stopping therapies. And there is a, there is a study ongoing right now uh, that's looking into that. And people who have been very stable for 15, maybe 20 years are over the age of 60 uh, and have not had any decline in, or worsening in their disease, that they may be able to come off of their medication. You always run the risk of falling off the curve. You always run the risk, especially in that leaking sw swimming pool, uh, of uh, by doing that, that you're going to uh, perhaps trigger uh, a, a lesion to occur. Famous quotation by a great man. Next slide. So there's that light in the, in the darkness there. So again, I always used to like the slide where it depicted the iceberg and, and, and the trinity of any treatment uh, efficacy is reducing relapses, having an impact on, on MRI, what we see on an MRI, and, and obviously having an impact on disability. Well, what we know about studies in general is they take the cream of the crop of patients with multiple sclerosis. These are people that are, are pretty much unblemished. They don't have uh, a, a lot of comorbidities. Uh, there are not a lot of issues with them, so they, they select patients for these studies. So we're, we're seeing kind of an abnormal uh, or a generalization in, in, in the results of these, these studies. So we have to be very careful about kind of transferring that into the real world, because in the real world, people are small, they're big, they're overweight, they're, they, they don't eat, they smoke, they have other, they have diabetes, they have heart disease. So it becomes very difficult I think in choosing the correct medication. Again, no one medication fits everybody. But the Trinity relapses, MRI, disability has now added another one, and that's brain atrophy, along with, and in that subgroup is, is gray matter atrophy. That's important because uh, what we're finding, what we're finding medications now are structuring. Uh, efficacy as far as looking at brain matter, reduction in brain matter atrophy. So efficacy, again, I talked about, again, redu reducing the relapse rates, slowing down, worsening, MRI lesion load, those are all important. And, and the new one that's added to the list is, does it slow down brain atrophy? What we know about patients, normal patients, is they have probably about a 0.2% loss in brain volume per year. We talk about patients with MS 
it may be close to 0.5 or even 1% per year in brain atrophy. So we, we can uh, obtain data from some of the agents that, yeah, it does work in slowing down brain atrophy, which becomes very important on selecting a medication for our, our patients in the future. And again, this is that I'm um, beating this slide to death because I just love this concept and it, it's, it's kind of replaced my notion of the iceberg where you, you see what's on the surface, but there's certainly a lot of things going on underneath that we're not always aware of, even with the, in the best of conditions with MRI scanning where it is right now. So safety should, efficacy should never supplant safety. And in the, the good old days, and I'm, a, I'm an old neurologist these days, I, we would always only have to worry about flu-like symptoms, injection site reactions, maybe some flushing, fever, things like that. And as we've gone along with this disease, we, we've gotten agents that are a little bit their mechanism of action is a little bit more aggressive, rebooting the immune system in, in with several of these agents. And, and by doing so, we got to worry about other things. And we, we always worry about liver and cardiac and visual. We see autoimmunities with, that can occur with some of these agents. We, we know that malignancies have, have popped up with, with using some of these agents. And of course, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy became uh, on the tip of all neurologists who treat MS tongue uh, back in 2006 there about with, with natalizumab showing cases with that and, and we've seen it with other agents now as well. And that's always very worrisome about treating our patients. Uh, the development of, of PML can be very deadly. And now today in 2020, we worry about this new virus. COVID-19, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that towards the end of the, the discussion here. What's, what you need to know is there's almost always something that can be done with an MS patient outside of the disease-modifying therapies. False risk screening, getting them to see a physical therapist to see what their gait's like, what do they need, to help with their walking? Do they need a cane? Do they need a rolling walker? Do they need even a motorized uh, chair to kind of get them around? So fall risk screening is very important. Being aggressive in treating bladder infections, starting people uh, on, on, Medica on antibiotics to treat their bladder infection is I think very useful because uh, a, a bladder infection can really set people back behind the eight ball and, and cause them to have marked disability until that infection is treated. Fatigue, I think, is seen in almost virtually everybody with this disease. We used to think it was like two thirds, but I, I really think this is a major player in most patients with multiple sclerosis. And this can be dealt with. Uh, in the summertime, you need to stay cool. I use uh, ibuprofen or Tylenol when it's really hot in my patients to kind of lower their body temperatures cooling towels, things like that, staying out of the sun, just staying indoors, which we're doing, everybody's doing, but fatigue can be treated. Fatigue is something that needs to be treated and, and needs to be uh, treated from the get-go. Cognitive impairment, this is kind of the old brain atrophy, gray matter thing, and though we don't have a whole lot that we can do for that, I think staying sharp is kind of an individual uh, decision on, on, on patients. I, I encourage my patients to read, listen to good music. Uh, when they're going to read, maybe don't read a novel, but maybe an article or two a day. Uh, play that Sudoku. I think those things kind of uh, stimulate the brain to kind of keep you sharp and get involved with things. You know, stay sharp by being involved. Volunteer yourself. Depression, uh, I, I'd say three quarters of patients with multiple sclerosis suffer from depression. Pain is a, is a big issue in patients with multiple sclerosis and, and sometimes very difficult to treat. Standard treatments don't always work and we have to think outside of the box sometimes with treating pain. Spasticity is a big one and we have good agents that can do that. We have medications we can deliver intrathecally to kind of treat spasticity. But there is almost always something that can be done for an MS patient. If you can't 
have them on the right disease modifying therapy or if you find that the disease modifying therapy is not working. I, I label this lawyers, guns, and money uh, only because of these are some of the other things I wanted to talk to you about uh, in regards to multiple sclerosis. The big thing, the big wave is this notion of the duck, of the of the di of diet in the gut microbiome. Uh, that's very important. It's becoming more important as we go along. You you realize that the gut is the first place our immune system is stimulated. Uh, both the innate and the uh, adaptive immune system uh, are mediated through the gut. So what we what we take in may be very important. And then they're doing a lot of studies in regards to changing the gut microbiome in patients, trying to find out why MS patients. Uh, what their gut microbiome is like and what, what we can do to maybe change that to reduce disability or worsening of their MS. Exercise is, vi exercise is vital. Uh, exercise is very important and Jeff's going to kind of talk to you a little bit more. Everybody can do it. Even if you're chair bound or bed bound, you can do upper extremity exercises. Stretching is extremely important. Staying active. Vitamin D, we know that vitamin D deficiency is associated with higher relapse rates, more rapid progression, and higher rate of brain atrophy. Reduced vitamin D levels, reduced sunlight exposure, and, and diets lower in vitamin D all correlate strongly with disease severity. So higher vitamin D correlates uh, strongly with increased Treg activity and better Th2 to Th1 ratio. These are uh, these are helper cells. Uh, these are T cells that are helper cells in, in, in your body. Smoking, please don't. Children of patients who smoke in home have a higher rate of MS. Smoking increases the likelihood of conversion from clinically isolated syndrome to MS. The increased rate of conversion from relapsing remitting MS to secondary progressive MS is also seen in a higher rate with smokers and smokers have more MRI activity. More disability accumulates during disease in smokers. My last two are be active, join something, be involved in something, whether it's a knitting group, a church group, a gardening group, the library foundation, or start something. Look what Stuart has done with, with, with this. I mean, do something, become involved. I have, I have a patient in Lafayette, Indiana, and she's just the she is just a go-getter. She has started the, the, the MS Society up there, and she is just a, a ball of fire, and it keeps her young, and it keeps her vibrant. So join something, start something. So what's on the horizon? Go ahead and load that for me, Bill. Okay. So this whole notion about gray matter involvement is, is kind of intriguing. And there's this notion that is, is uh, the multiple sclerosis and, and outside in disease, meaning that the, it gets triggered in your periphery, out in your bloodstream, and then goes into your brain, or does it get triggered in your brain and then goes outside to recruit these bad uh, autoimmune cells? So we're, we're looking at treatments that kind of maybe get to deeper parts of the brain, actually get into the brain and have an effect on treating the immune system and the immune milieu in the brain. Better treatment for progressive disease. Right now, we only have one agent that's been released to treat uh, primary progressive disease. We have another agent that we use solely for secondary progressive disease. Biomarkers, neurofilament light chains are, are the latest rage. Uh, they are more determined of tissue damage than what type of multiple sclerosis a patient has. They are a marker for activity. So we can tell maybe even before we see MRI changes that if there's a bump in their uh, neurofilament light chain that, that the disease is active and whatever agent they're on may not be effective. It is pleasant and that follows with, it is a marker for response to disease modifying therapy. We talked a little bit about the gut microbiome Stay tuned for that. I think that's going to be very interesting. Precision MS. And what I mean by that is right now, basically, we are still, and I mean physicians, neurologists who treat a lot of MS, we are still throwing darts at the dartboard blindfolded. We really need to be more precise in how we treat patients 
for this disease. We're getting there. We do have certain targeted agents that I think are more effective. I mentioned there's 15 agents out there, but I personally probably only still use about, about five for one reason or the other. Advanced imaging. Uh, so we've, we've graduated to 3T MRIs, and soon there will be uh, 7T MRIs, and we're going to be able to notice lesions in, in the gray matter a lot easier, and that might be helpful. Determining brain atrophy if someone is slipping off the curb, if, the, if that leaky pool is kind of leaking more than it should. So we still got a long ways to go to get to the other side of the canyon. Uh, and there's a lot of obstacles still in our way. I'm excited about this disease. And, and, and I've told this story countless times when, when I've, we were first talking about multiple sclerosis back in 1993, there was virtually um, maybe 20 articles per year about multiple sclerosis. Now we get about 500 to 600 articles per year about multiple sclerosis. It's an exciting time. Things are getting better. The chasm may be long, it may be deep, but I think we're gonna to get to the other side eventually. So I wanted to end this talk on COVID-19, a little bit my knowledge, what I know about this so far. So the emerging evidence suggests that it doesn't appear that people with multiple sclerosis are at increased risk of getting COVID-19, okay? Seems that there's no increased risk if you have MS getting it. Patients on most DMTs do not appear to be at a higher risk of getting COVID-19. Interestingly, COVID-19 infection has two phases. The virus-driven, where you get infected with the virus, and that involves your innate immunity, and that's the flu-like symptoms, that's that type of stuff. And then the immune response-driven, where you get this cytokine drive, where where your immune system kicks in overdrive when it really shouldn't. And that's what really causes damage and side effects and blood clots and, and scar tissues in the lungs. In some cases, disease modifying therapies may pl play a role in dampening down this immune response driven part of the infection. There's some notion that people on disease modifying therapy are less likely to get the second phase, some notion. Again, stay tuned. So generally speaking, what I'm doing, I have not changed my treatment plans during this time. I altered them for a few months, March, April, and May. I held off on using ocrelizumab and alemtuzumab uh, because of their mechanism of action, but I'm back to using these agents again. Uh, we have seen that the B cell depleting agents can temper the response to vaccinations. So that might be important down the road, uh, especially with the develop, hopefully the development of uh, vaccinations for COVID-19. And interestingly, lymphocyte trafficking agents may be more egregious of the DMTs in this setting, meaning that if you don't get lymphocytes to cross the blood brain barrier, uh, there may be some, that may be more of an issue. Uh, rather than the B cell depleting agents. We'll see, so far we don't, we, we, we're still collecting data. And the most important thing to know is decisions are never made in a vacuum. I try to treat my patients as individuals. No two people are alike. I, I try to select the medication I think is right for them re, uh, based upon their disease, where they are with their disease, and sometimes because of social situations, but decisions are never made in a vacuum. And I always encourage my patients to discuss what they're feeling and what they're thinking. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank Stuart very much for inviting me to, to talk to you. These are always very, very pleasurable discussions. And I wish I could be there in person and live and maybe someday, maybe next year, we'll be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Janicki. And yes, round of applause. Yeah, you wear your Detroit hat. I was thinking <laughs> about all the times we're gonna beat you up this year, right? All right, <laughs> so um, anyway, thank you for doing that again. And we do have several questions, um, um, several from those that are on here tonight, as well as those that had pre-written in 
their questions. And so the first one is um, they want to know how I can take care of my family and home. And I say they. I don't know if it's a he or a she. So you may may hear me say they or he or she. Um, how can I take care of my family and our home on a daily basis without completely exhausting myself and making me feel useless most of the time? Well, that's a good question. I, I And I don't know who's in the family and ages, but I would relegate duties. I'd have everybody should be rolling up their sleeves, especially now and chipping in and, and doing chores around the house. You know, there, there are plenty of things that even small children can help you with. But I, I would make it a point that you fatigue is a major factor in this disease that get people get people in your family to kind of chip in. They need to start doing something. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next, uh, if the relapse is longer than a month, what can help reduce the stress and the pain? Uh, well, there are agents out there for, is this about a pain issue? There are agents that are for pain uh, without getting into off the off label kind of treatments. Uh, there are several that I've been using lately that uh, I think have had some impact in reducing pain, uh, but yeah, I, I, I need a little bit more specifics about that. I think so. Okay. So going on to the next one, do DMTs relieve symptoms of MS indirectly since they help keep the MS quiet? They do. I mean, if you have an attack that the, the, the actual disease modifying therapy you're on is not going to do anything for that specific attack. Uh, the whole notion is to reduce the number of tax, for attacks, reduce the relapses, and, and by doing that, hopefully reduce uh, things as, as, as uh, like fatigue or cognitive decline. So uh, it, it kind of leads to that, but it's not specific for that. Okay, great. Thank you. A, a person just wrote in, um, they want to know if you would prescribe betaseron over any of the newer drugs that are happening today that that's also kind of an interesting question i i never i never was a big beta seron user i used another interferon beta uh agent preferentially i but uh there is some notion i think there's been an uptick in interferon usage because of the covid virus that there's some you know the interferons were first designed to uh fight viruses so there is some notion that so maybe i guess my answer is maybe Okay, thank you. Um, person writes, I took Avonex IM several years ago. Since it paralyzed my leg, I quit and never took another MS drug. If you don't know what is causing MS, how then can you come up with which drug to take? And, and I think that's kind of what I was discussing in, in, in that it is very difficult, but you can't, you can't afford to have any more relapses. You can't, again, looking at that Stephen Krieger model of of the leaking swimming pool, uh, you have one visible attack that caused some significant damage in the shallow end, uh, but you may have some others lurking underneath. So you, what you want to do is reduce the accumulation of more lesions in that leaky swimming pool. Great. Thank you for that. All right. Um, if I get approved for at-home assistance, neighbors have said that I'll be hard-pressed to find anybody from an agency to drive out. So maybe she or he are in a rural area. Is it just not worth their time for the money? What suggestions you might have? The, the person did not specify where he or she is living. So just by what was asked, I'm, I'm sort of thinking that they're not in a populated area. Yeah, this is this is crazy time. So yeah, people are really afraid of the of the pandemic. And though we've kind of flattened the curve in, in, in most cases, this, I think there's kind of been an uptick on a number of cases so yeah that that is disturbing because uh you know we talk about the death from the viruses but we're seeing uh, a lot of issues in in people uh who are kind of a secondary effect the innocent bystander effect because of the virus so uh, again hopefully have good support with family or or, or in people in the community that can help you uh but yeah that that is a really tough one in this day and age Okay, thank you for that. Any new treatment for MS fatigue? 
Well, there there is uh, not specifically, and there's there's several agents out there, and I don't know if, if you want me to mention them, Stuart. I don't know how how important it is, but there we, we start with something as old as a mantidine. We've used that for probably hundreds hundreds of years, as long as I've been on the on the planet. Uh, but there are other agents you can do, and there are things you can modify in your in your day to day activities that can help with, with fatigue, but I trust me. I I do feel that fatigue is probably very very detrimental to to our patients with multiple sclerosis. Great, thank you. Um, probiotics and prebiotics. Can you tell us what the difference is? No, I can't. I'm sorry. I don't know what the difference is between probiotics and prebiotics. Okay. I'm sorry. That's a good well, one. Be a quick question and quick answer then. All right. Um, what is the status of researching drugs to repair? Myelin. You spoke about, um, you know, what's out there possibly to yeah. to help it, but is there anything to repair it? Yeah. So the the initial study on 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 repairing myelin, the oligodendrocytes, kind of was a, a failure. There was a a small offshoot of the study that shed maybe some light that it can be done, but right now we're still kind of in limbo in in in, in protecting myelin and regrowing myelin. The problem with regrowing myelin is kind of random and, and so uh, what we're seeing is that it doesn't go where it's really needed so uh, that's kind of not panned out so far but that's certainly very important I think the most important thing is is uh, neuronal function ner nerve cell function okay thank you um, can you describe how to best alleviate cognitive issues uh, the Best thing to do is number one, when you when you get the diagnosis, you've got to realize that this is going to happen to virtually everybody. You know, we've always for the longest time thought this was a white matter disease. It it is truly that, but where we see the most problems with this disease as far as disability and worsening is because of the gray matter. Stay sharp, stay active, stay involved, you know, do things for yourself, take a course, uh, you know, go to the library, read books, read articles. I mean, the most important thing, stay, if you can stay at work, that's, that's helping you a lot. It really is. Uh, some of that is pie in the sky for some people because of the disability from a physical disability. But if you have a computer, doing card games are even helpful. But most importantly, stay, to stay sharp, stay topical, stay current. Great. Thank you. All right, let's get in a couple of COVID questions since we have several of them. And the first one is, um, has COVID had a significant impact on the way you treat your MS patients? Good question. I think it did at first. I think back in March and April, we, we held off on, on some of the infusions because of the notion that uh, they would wipe out a percentage of the, of the T and B cells in a person's body. So we, we didn't want to expose somebody with uh, who had the potential uh, of getting COVID. And at that time, we thought maybe MS patients were more at risk. And as we've seen with collecting data, and they, have a, they, they, they are doing a study in, in collecting data that uh, probably there isn't that big of an increased risk of COVID in MS patients, and that uh, we can safely go ahead and resume infusions. And I, I resumed infusions, uh, my first one at the end of April, I did a, an alemtuzumab, I believe, in May. So, yeah, we're, we're getting back on track, and we're just being very dil diligent about keeping track of their the patient and their labs. Yeah. You know, just a little side note, um, I know that uh, for those that have been using or did have Lentrata, and they may not have been able to get uh, blood draws at home, um, that that uh, Sanofi has come up with a, a new company, uh, not come up with, but they but they just um, had an agreement signed with a new company to get out there and do those blood draws again. That's great. I didn't hear that. I'm, I, I'm going to be mad at my, my rep. Your TLL, yeah. yeah. Yeah, your TLL should have told you this already. But, but don't feel like you're the only one. We actually sent it out to our medical advisory board and Almost everybody responded back the same thing. And I sent that to them yesterday. We, we as an organization found out just two days ago. And so, um, you know, we're able to tell our medical board 
but I figured that there's many more doctors out there that just haven't gotten word of that yet either. So, okay. So I wanted to make shame that on known. you, Tina. Well, shame on whoever that it just hasn't filtered down all the way yet. And right. okay. Next COVID question: COVID nineteen and the interaction with different MS medications. You did just mention that uh, that you're resuming, but which medications are the safest to use currently with no problems for the MS patient? <laughs> I, I think uh, I, I think the interferons are safe, and, and I, I I'm a big fan of Abagio. I, I think that has some antiviral properties. So so uh, those those agents I think are, are are very safe and may have some pro stuff in fighting viruses. So that's that's just my thought. So along your thought, now I'm just going to add in something else. I don't know if you saw these articles. But interferon B is being studied in Italy, I believe, for uh, for use against COVID. All right, and uh, because their antiviral, because of its antiviral property, and um, yeah, well, it's it's on our blog. You can go what check is, it out. I'm sorry. Blog. What did you say? Interferon B, beta yes. B. Yes. Yes. Right. right. So that's yeah. uh, so that's being studied right now. But if anybody wants to know more about it. You can go to our website, click on our blog, and and read about it. It's it's been in the last two days where it was published onto our site. Okay, I'm just trying to add to these questions. I mean answers. All right, that's all I'm trying to do. All right, our um, going back to the infusion therapies. Is there anything? What do you what do you prefer? Right, an infusion therapy over an oral or an injectable? Wow, and again, it depends on the patient. I think I lean more towards uh, escalate. I'm not. I'm sorry. Lean more towards high efficacy. So uh, I like the infusions better. And, and depending upon the situation, I probably use uh, elemtuzumab over anything else. But I'm a, also a big fan of cladribine. I think uh, uh, it's it doesn't have the autoimmune problems that you can maybe see with elemtuzumab. But the data supporting uh, being one and done is is kind of outstanding in both of those agents. So those those are you know we, we, if we treat fifty percent if we treat a lot of MS patients and fifty percent of them may be done with treatment after two in infusions or two crowns of treatment with cladribine that that's kind of interesting. I I've always thought that was really great data. Okay, thank you. A uh, person wants to know what other diseases mimic MS. Uh, well, you can you can talk about uh, one of them. Probably the most important that's out there in the in is neuromyelitis optica can mimic MS. Uh, the MRIs may be a little bit diff different. Uh, the pat pathology where it where it occurs is, is different than it is in in MS. It involves the astrocytes, where MS involves the oligodendrocytes. Uh, lupus can present and look a lot like MS. Uh, even some certain vascular diseases. Can can mimic multiple sclerosis. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you, hear, you can hear me. All right, great. Because I, a notice just came up on my screen that my audio was gone. So I just wanted to make sure you could hear me. I don't know why it's there. All right. Um, next thing. Uh, what does possible MS mean? I guess she or he are talking about uh, CS CIS. What what? The question is, what does it mean for possible MS? So that is a, a diagnosis where it's not been totally made. I think CIS would probably fit into that clinically isolated syndrome uh, with the new criteria, McDonald's criteria for making the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. It has become a little bit easier. I think spinal fluid addition with the MRI scan makes the diagnosis of MS uh, a lot more likely possible might be those people that were still not sure. They may only have two lesions in their in their brain and, and they're in their cerebral hemispheres and they presented with uh, something suspicious, but it wasn't optic neuritis. Maybe it was just some sensory symptoms. So, you know, those people need to be watched closely. As I showed that one MRI scan in that individual, one year change between the left scan and the right scan. Okay. Thank you. Um, a person is uh, asking about 
you know, everybody now with going back to a COVID question, everybody having to be extra careful. And when states are back to 100 um, percent, what will it be going forward with wearing masks, staying away from large crowds? And um, and, you know, they also want to know about the dangers that there might be in flying and cruising. Well, I, I hope that we get back to normal. I, I don't see that. I, you know, I'm, I'm a lot less optimistic that that's going to happen until maybe next spring. I, oh, I, hate, I hate what I just said. Uh, it is so hard to know because what I'm hoping we're seeing is, and we've seen this uptick in cases. What I'm hoping we're seeing is just an uptick in cases and that there's not an uptick in in deaths and things like that. Because if we're seeing an uptick in cases, we are gonna develop herd immunity. If we do get a vaccination, that's gonna to help too. So my, my feeling, my gut feeling is that six months from now, we'll have a better idea. We're back in the flu season again, but I think by next spring, we'll be, I would say 90% normal. So you just brought up a word though that many people don't understand and that is, or I should say word, but words, herd community. Can you explain what herd community is? Well, herd, immuni herd immunity, immunity is, is, yes, sorry. Yeah, is, is uh, immunity that develops when enough people in the population get the infection that it can't be spread anymore because you, you keep on bumping into somebody who's already had the infection. So uh, even if you've never had it, it, it's less likely that you are going to catch it because of, because of herd immunity. The whole notion about this virus and a lot of things we don't know is is how deadly it is. I you know we're we're, we're seeing that it it we do know it affects the elderly a lot more than it affects the young people. I mean it, that as far as deaths. So so that is something we need to be very cautious about. If you are a smoker, if you have diabetes, you have to be extremely careful. I I am a I've become pathologic about washing my hands. Uh, I really have. I'm, I, I'm, I, I wear my mask when I'm in the hospital. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think what we want is that enough people get this disease that it becomes less likely it's going to be transmitted. Okay. There's a question coming up, but before I give it all to you, I, I would just like to um, bring up and have you give your wisdom on it as well, in that um, MS patients, many, many thousands believe that because they have MS, they're immune compromised. I'm not understanding why they did not learn that they have an overactive immune system and not an underactive immune system. Can you please explain that to them right now? And it'll help answer three of my next questions. Okay, so so multiple sclerosis is an immune mediated disease. It doesn't necessarily mean that your immune system uh, can't fight infections, nor can it fight tumors and things like that. But your immune system, a portion of it at least, a, a segment of it, is attacking yourself. So it's causing damage to your, your central nervous system in this case. Uh, what we're trying to do with the agents is to kind of tamper that inflammation, that, that activity down without causing damage to the rest of the immune system. And if you look at a lot of these drugs, if you really look at a lot of these drugs, there really isn't that big of an increase in infections or tumors. There are, there are certain agents that, that we have to be very careful with, but, but for the most part, you, you are not uh, immune comp competent, uh, immune, immunosuppressed with, with multiple sclerosis. We may make you that a little bit with our, our agents, but the average MS patient is not immunosuppressed. All right. And immunosuppressed, you're saying that they're not immune compromised. Correct. Not immune compromised. Correct. Thank you. All right. So that did help out with a few of the questions here. And going forward, though, the person wants uh, is letting me know this is, um, I guess, her husband or his husband is going back to school on the 29th of July. They'll have to uh, be teaching 50 kids in a class and they will not be wearing masks. What do I need to say to him to stay safe? When I asked my doctor, she just said, follow the CDC guidelines. <laughs> well, interesting. interestingly enough, we're seeing more and more data that 
that uh, kids don't seem to transmit this disease to adults. At least that there is some data coming out of, I think, Germany and, and out of Europe that, that we're, we're finding that the Germans are going back to school and, and that, that children at least, and again, I don't know what, what age he's, he's teaching, but you know, we're talking about 12 and under that this may be something that they don't pass on to adults. So uh, the most, again, I think you have to have that Purell on your desk. I think that's keeping your surfaces clean, uh, keeping your hands clean. And if there's a teacher, you want to wear a mask, by all means, but I, I, I don't think the students, the young kids don't ne necessarily need to do that. That's strange. So in Florida, we're hearing like something different about that. But Is like that right? Kids, like, but like the kids are incubators to this, to this virus. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, there's, there's some, I can get you some data on that, but there really is kind of, we're seeing that it's children are not passing this on to, to adults. Okay. Well, that would be the good news. Um, what research is being done to reboot the immune system? Well, we, we have a couple of agents that are in, that do that. We have several agents that do that. Uh, again, we're developing agents that can may play a role uh, on doing that in the actual central nervous system, in the brain itself, uh, to reboot the immune system. And, and, and for me, that's the primary issue, is that if you could, and this is where uh, stem cell comes in, uh, if you could get rid of the immune system that's causing the problem, and get started on a new immune system, you may be less likely of, of having MS anymore. And we have good data with several of these agents that, uh, you know, half of the people 10 years out now, nine years, 10 years out, uh, have not required more than two treatments. So I think the, the answer is in rebooting the immune system. That, that's my personal bias. Uh, down the road, you know, regrowing neurons, remyelinating, those are all uh, helpful. I mean, if you get to a patient who has significant disability, uh, rebooting their immune system may not, will certainly not change that disability that's already taken place. Okay, great. Thank you. We're going to do two more questions and then we're going to have to get on to our next speaker. So the first one is a very good one. I mean, I feel that way too. And I also tell people much about that, you know, my, my symptoms might, might not necessarily be MS related. It could be part of the aging process. And the question <laughs> is, is how do you tell if something is a relapse or part of the aging process? That, that's tough. It really is tough. Discuss it with your doctor. Uh, your doctor hopefully knows you. And, and, and certainly uh, as we get older, we get all sorts of things, vision, uh, bladder. So, you know, there, there, are, there are things. Women who've had who are older, who've had multiple pregnancies, will have bladder issues, may, which may not be related to their MS. So discuss that with your doctor, and, and hopefully they can you can work something out and try to figure out what's what truly is MS related and what truly is uh, getting aged. Great, thank you. Next question, and then I'll be making a quick statement here. But um, does having a back backlifting pump help with spasticity? I think so. I, I think I've been quite impressed with the uh, baclofen pumps. Now they're they're useful for spasticity in the lower extremities. They, if you have spasticity in the upper extremities, they don't do too much because of the placement of the catheter is probably only as high as T6. But I think it's it's been a game changer in a lot of my patients, it, my progressives and my relap my secondary progressives, uh, in in maintaining ambulatory skills. So. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that's the end of the MS questions. That's the end of the COVID questions. All right. A person did write, though, that he or she has posterior tibia tendon dysfunction and has been given a brace and wants, wants to know what to do to strengthen the tendon. And I'm laughing about this one because I have the same thing. Right. And I was given this crazy brace, which is like a, uh, you can't see it, this. Is a is a solid brace. It's it's like having a cast with a uh, with a leather shell around it, right? And it's the strangest thing, but but effectively, I've had this problem for um, for almost three years, and this is the first doctor that gave me something that's actually working. But the person would like to know 
what they can do to strengthen that tendon. Do you have an answer for them? Yeah, you maybe know, Jeff does, huh? Yeah, maybe Jeff does, exactly. All right. I've got a punt, sorry. That's okay. Doctor, thank you very much for joining us tonight.